morning. My name is Chiquita Searle, and first of all, I'd like to extend a thank you to George for inviting me to host the Top Women in Tech panel this morning. So I think it's no secret that we now live in a very technologically driven world. With the advent of smartphones, social media, fast internet, and online functionality, it stands to reason that tech was always going to become a very integral part of our business lives. As such, I take great delight in introducing five women who have been steadily disrupting their own industries with their shrewd use of tech within their own entrepreneurial endeavors. First, I'd like to welcome Kate McKibben, who is the CEO and founder of Drop Dead Gorgeous Daily and Secret Bloggers Business. Kate, in her own words, is a very tall, super nerdy pun enthusiast, after cutting her teeth in the magazine industry, launched one of Australia's largest independent lifestyle blogs, Drop Dead Gorgeous Daily, in 2007. In 2014, Kate leveraged her own blogging success and created Secret Bloggers Business, an online e-course where she shares everything that she's learned about how to create, grow, and run a successful blogging business. Taryn Williams is the CEO and founder of Wink Models and The Right Fit. Taryn is recognized as one of Australia's youngest and most successful female entrepreneurs. She founded Wink Models in 2007 and growing it into a business with an annual turnover of four million. Taryn's next venture, The Right Fit, will disrupt the industry, offering clients an online marketplace that allows them to search, compare, and book models in one smooth transaction. Launched in 2000, <laughs> December 2015, The Right Fit will remove bias and empower models and clients to make informed decisions about their next job or casting. Julie Stavenia is the CEO and founder of Style Runner. Pioneering and disruptive, Julie founded and launched Style Runner in 2012 as the first pure play activewear aggregator globally. It has since shipped more than 50,000 parcels worldwide to over 100 countries, built a cult social media following, and a portfolio of 50 curated sportwear labels, including major labels Nike, Adidas, Puma, Reebok, and Lululemon, which was a world first. Danielle Lewis is the CEO and co-founder of Scrunch.com. Danielle launched a successful Brisbane lifestyle blog in 2010, through which she uncovered the need for a platform to demystify the return influencers bring to brand collaborations. In 2014, Danielle left a promising cor corporate career to launch tech startup, scrunch.com, which is a platform that helps brands discover the right influencers and measure their ROI. And finally, we have Beck Derrington, who is the CEO and founder of Source Bottle and the Influencer Hub. Beck is an experienced public relations strategist who founded the game-changing free media lead site Source Bottle in 2009, which was designed to give everyone a better chance of sharing the story with the media, thus generating powerful publicity for themselves and their businesses. Late in 2015, Beck developed the Influencer Hub app, an easy-to-use platform that builds, manages, and houses bespoke influencer communities for brands on the platform. Both are available in the US, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, and also the UK. So welcome, ladies. So just to give you a little heads up on the format, we're going to be touching on four different themes, um, and then we're going to move into a Q&A session towards the end. So if any of the themes resonate with you, if you can make a note of your questions that you'd like to ask the girls, and then we'll make sure that we get to that at the end. So the first thing that we're going to kick off with is how is tech disrupting business models? Um, so I think one of the most popular start questions for startups these days is, you know, what is your business model? Because ultimately everyone wants to know how you're making your money. Um, business model models can be typically set, but I think one of the most um, possible, possibly the most difficult thing is to decide which one is right for your business and implement, implement it correctly. Um, so ladies, talk us through each of your business models and how did you decide which one was right for your business? Kate, we'll start with you. Um, uh, so basically, I've got two business models because I've got two very different businesses. Um, uh, my background originally was in magazines, so when I first started uh, Drop Dead Gorgeous Daily, uh, initially I just followed the pretty stock standard magazine um, way of monetizing, so, you know, connecting with brands and uh, doing campaigns for them and that kind of thing. Um, after a few years, I realized that this was a, not, let's say, not the best <laughs> business model out there because as soon as, you know, I think about a year and a half after I started my business, the uh, GFC happened and the first thing that gets pulled is advertising budgets. So all of a sudden, thing, you know, 
things got a little bit leaner. Um, so since then, I've been working to develop different kinds of um, monetization strategies, things like creating your own e-products, um, that sort of thing. And that's been a much more reliable and sustainable way of running a business. So that's what, then my second business, Secret Bloggers Business, was based off that business model. It was, yeah, never interested in working with brands, just all about creating your own products, giving great value, connecting with your audience, and monetizing by giving them offerings that sort of suit what they're after. And giving bloggers an opportunity to create their own brand. Yeah, exactly. So Taryn. Yeah, so um, we are essentially an online marketplace. So we had a couple of different options on how we could monetize that. So we ended up deciding to go for a hybrid of two models. So we charge a commission on every booking that comes through the platform. So it's much heavily reduced compared to an, a traditional offline talent agency. So we have uh, the commission structure and then we also have a subscription model. So talent can join the site for free and they have that option. They can have certain functionality on the site and when they're ready to make that commitment and really integrate it into part of their lives, then they can join up and pay a subscription fee, which is just 10.95 a month. So the subscription fee is for the right fit? Yes, And the weak right. models is commission-based? Yes, and there's commission also in the right fit. Yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Julie? Uh, we're essentially a pure play aggregator. It's a model that's been around a long time in fashion and luxury fashion. Um, but in 2012, I realised that no one was really doing it for sportswear uh, for women. So we're not really reinventing the wheel, we're simply bringing a, a really great existing business model to a new market and disrupting the sportswear market. So Pure Play um, meant that you were going to invest heavily in advertising, customer care and logistics. Um, was that part of your decision making before you decided to go that way or was it more the target market that you wanted to attract? Well, we, we, we realised this was a global opportunity. So the first thing that we wanted to do was have a business model that we could scale globally, which was part of the reason we wanted to be a Pure Play um, store rather than a you know hybrid of a brick and mortar store. Perhaps one day we'll go into that uh, area, but at the moment our focus is really on reaching the broadest audience internationally um, as we can. Um, advertising was something that we you know considered, but funnily enough, social media has been a huge advantage for us, and we actually haven't had to rely on it as much as possible. On the flip side, charging advertising, we do have a blog, and that's another area that we plan to monetize in the future. Okay, excellent. Danielle. Uh, so at Scrunch, we, like all good tech startups, have pivoted both business ideas and business models. Uh, so we started out in the virtual change room space, pivoted to a social network, um, until we landed on the B2B software platform that we are today. Um, so being a software platform, a software as a service model suited us quite well, um, and that's what we have gone to market with. Uh, we do have um, some interesting plans to monetize in different ways in the future, um, like Taryn said, so that commission style model taking a, a clip on the influences that come into the platform and the campaigns that are produced, uh, but right now it's pure play software as a service. Um, well, when I first started Source Bottle, I, I think I probably was a little naive. I hadn't actually thought about what potentially, how I was going to turn this into a legitimate business. So advertising was the, was the, per, the first sort of way of doing that, and that, that was a very standard sort of approach. Then, um, of course, I sort of evolved into a little bit more sophisticated sort of platform with a recurring income through a subscription model. And so that's what Source Bottle has evolved. So it has certain offerings that are actually um, subscription-based. And then Influencer Hub is pretty much the same as, as Scrunch in terms of the fact that it's a software as a service platform, uh, but it has a subscription model attached to it too. It's B2B. The Influencer Hub, that's an app base? Yeah, so it's, it's a platform very much like Scrunch in, and uh, in terms of they sort of... Yeah, the business, the brand houses influences on the platform itself and to get access to that, they pay a subscription. Okay, excellent. Danielle, I might just um, get your thoughts on this next one. Um, do you see any new online business models entering the market based on the tech innovation that is currently underway? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the business models that you see today are a testament to the fact that in the future, we're going to see some really interesting things. I mean. Uh, you know, today you think about crowdfunding, you think about 3D printing that's coming in and print on demand and manufacturing on demand. 
Um, even software as a service is only really coming into its own now. Um, I think as a result of that, we're going to see some really interesting business models. I think there's some really smart companies coming up that is going to shock us with the way that they decide to run their business. Um, I think there's some really interesting trends around cooperatives um, and collaborative bu business models. Um, and also I think sort of sustainability is probably the one to watch as well. Mm. Sustainability. I hope everyone recycles. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, Taryn, I might uh, get your thoughts on this. Um, in selecting your business model, how important was the user experience for you? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially at the heart of everything that we do, um, especially in the right fit. I mean, it was inherently why I chose to launch the company was to give both our clients and our talent a better user experience. So it really is in the heart of what we do. And it's one of the key reasons that we chose the pricing model and um, business model that we, we ended up going for. I mean, we could have chosen to charge a client, for example, to post their job on the site, um, or we could have charged talent to join up to the site from day one and not offer a free package. But we really wanted to build that trust with them first and, and have them understand how the platform works and have a really great experience with it before they're making any sort of financial commitment. Okay, excellent. So have any of your, well, you've mentioned you've pivoted, Danielle, but have any of your business, business models changed since inception? Um, and if so, why? <laughs> Beck? <laughs> uh, it, it certainly source bottle changed very much from the beginning because uh, <laughs> because I was making no money. And, uh, and for, to actually uh, generate advertising revenue, you need to have a critical mass, and I certainly didn't have that in the beginning. So I needed to start being pretty creative in terms of trying to identify subscription streams that people would be happily, you know, happily pay for um, on a recurring basis. And so that gave me a little bit more certainty um, that income was coming in and, until I could build up that critical mass. So subscription, sort of the model, evolved out of a quick pivot, sort of realising that advertising wasn't a great long-term strategy for me. And did it pick up as quickly as you, as soon as you changed and implemented that, did it, did it pick up for you quickly or was there a period of time where people had to adjust? <laughs> there was always a lag. There was always a lag between when I thought people would kind of just run with it and when they actually started to dribble and start to um, decide that this actually was something that could uh, offer them sort of a benefit as an ongoing service. So, yeah, no, it, there, was, there was no sort of spontaneous combustion moment. <laughs> For us, it was always just a very slow burn. Yeah, okay, cool. Does anyone else want to comment on that in terms of their business models and whether it changed? Okay, then. Um, so that's that for that theme. Um, so the next theme that we'd like to move through is how do businesses keep up with consumers who are ultimately becoming more smart? Because, you know, we are very smart. Um, the, evolution <laughs> the evolution of digitally connected customers, primarily via their smartphones, lies at the heart of them ultimately becoming more tech savvy, um, which is reflecting the dramatic change in the relationship between customers and how they transact with businesses. So it is anticipated that in today's era of tech savvy shoppers, the businesses that are able to ha um, harness the consumer sentiment and act on those insights are the ones that will be m the most successful. Um, some believe the secret to harnessing a consumer's true thoughts, feelings emo and emotions lies in the data, with roughly 90% of um, data coming through in instru unstructured channels, so ultimately social medias, call centres, um, emails and surveys. Um, so Taryn and Julie, uh, within your own businesses, how do you collect and analyse your unstructured data to ensure that you are remaining at the forefront of your customer's mind? Um, Julie, we might start with you. Um, data is so important to us. We look at it every single day. There are some really great free tools. We use um, Google Analytics almost every day. You can look at things like your bounce rates. Um, we also look at our customer's lifetime value and our cohort analysis. So how often are customers coming back? How much are they spending over every year? And as new customers find you, are they spending just as much as previous cohorts? Um, that's a really good sign as to you know, how satisfied customers are. Um, you mentioned customer sentiment, and I think that's probably really at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we, can gauge, which we can gauge that via social media. How much are our customers talking about our product, and are they loving it? How much are they tagging their friends into it? What's that viral coefficient of you know, our, our uh, posts? Um, but one of the best ways that we've been uh, able to track our customer sentiment is with the Net Promoter Score survey. It's incredibly simple. It's one question. Uh, how likely would you be to recommend this brand to your friends on a scale of zero to 10? 
So we've been tracking that now for a couple of weeks. Um, and we've benchmarked ourselves against other online shopping stores. And it's something that we share with our entire team on a weekly basis. It's essentially become a KPI. Uh, every person in the team knows that they have the power to affect that sentiment from the person that wraps our product to the people that are taking our, um, you know, our photos at our photo shoot to the people who are answering phones in our customer service department. Every single person is responsible for the customer sentiment and the um, customer experience. So ultimately, you're making it a part of your culture. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Taryn? Yeah, so I mean, social media is a really big one for us as well. Um, really being able to interact and engage with your customers and find out their sentiments, their thoughts. We have a community manager who manages all of our Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn accounts and, and really does prompt those conversations and ask what's working and what's not and what they want to see more of or less of. Um, we've done formal surveys in the past to both our clients and our talent to to really get that feedback as well. Um, we use an internal Slack channel as well, which has really helped ah. us. So um, it's really great for people who, you know, when you're collecting little uh, snippets of phone calls or emails, things that may not seem um, like they're worthy of a whole report on, um, but collating those in one place, you can really start to see trends coming through, getting that feedback and sentiment. But uh, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, can you give us an example of um, something that you've collected um, and yeah, you've in initiated a change based on that feedback? Yeah, I mean, there's been some really great little ones um, when we've rolled out new features that we thought would be really, really valuable and that people were really going to love um, and then seeing there being no conversation around that, people yeah. actually not using the features. Yeah. Um, and you're obviously tracking Google Analytics, seeing what pages they're using and things like that. But seeing on social media things that we thought were going to be really, really popular and that people wanted actually not being needed at all. So being able to pivot based on that set of information. It's always interesting because I think that um, often what people say they want and then what they really want are two very different things. And Absolutely. this data is really important in capturing that because a lot of people sometimes don't even know what they want and it's up to us to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Beck, how do you use tech to really get to know your customers um, and heighten their loyalty to your brand? And can you provide an example from your own business um, in how you've done that? I, I use um, Chiquita what's technically called um, the squeaky wheel approach. So <laughs> people that are really causing me angst on social media um, with issues, I, I'm very responsive to. So I'm not trying to encourage that kind of behaviour, but I do sort of feel that when they're being very vocal and visible with an issue, um, I need to personally respond to that straight away and very visibly as well. So I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm just trying to sort of get to the, the root of the issue. And if I can address it really quickly, I find that works so well in my favour. I think one of the other things... I'm sorry, that's my phone. It's an alarm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's just, you just swipe it, just swipe it, it'll stop. Um, yeah, just distracting, sorry. So, so yeah, so I think um, one of the things that I, so I do really try to pay a lot of attention and I haven't, um, I've outsourced a lot of the tweeting, Facebooking sort of and approving of call outs and things on Source Bottle, but I haven't outsourced dealing with a lot of the customer issues, which really is, an absolute chore, but I find that if I respond personally to something um, and sort of it's my reputation at, uh, at, you know, at stake um, and they, they're quite refreshed that I'm prepared to get my hands dirty and get involved in the issue and I find that actually it really enhances brand loyalty. Mm -hmm. They think I'm taking them seriously. Yeah, I think one of the worst things you can do is delete comments when they're, or delete negative comments. Oh, yeah, never do Transparency that. is key. Transparency is key. Um, Kate, what are your thoughts on this? Um, for me, the main way that we've used sort of like data and technology and stuff to help with growing relationships with um, customers is through um, there's so many really, really smart tracking tools and tagging tools now. Um, we, uh, yeah, I think early last year, switched over to an email system that sort of tracks everything that everybody's doing on the website and then, you know, it triggers certain things when certain things happen. So for, um, especially as a publisher, if I can see that someone's reading a lot of stuff about blackheads or something like that. <laughs> That's one of our most popular posts is about how to, but you know, we've then started creating these little follow-up email series that are triggered by a certain amount of activity on a certain topic. So, I mean, it can seem a bit stalky, so you've obviously got to word it properly. Um, I think the first time we did it with the email went out was, um, oh, so we hear you've got blackheads, like, check this out. 
<laughs> people liked it. They responded. Um, but yeah, a bit big brother. But you know, you, there's so many smart tools that let you do things like that. Can you like tell that. us some of those tools that you use? Um, yeah, so I use a tool called um, Active Campaign. It's kind of like MailChimp, but on steroids. It's not as bad as like Infusionsoft, which I know a lot of people love, but I call it Infusionsoft. I hate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it lets you, yeah, exactly. You can trigger things based on what people have clicked, what they've read, what they've forwarded, all that kind of stuff. And I think people really respond to that more personalised mm. approach. Um, and it's, you know, it's them, if a, if a consumer is saying, I'm interested in this thing by reading a, something or viewing a certain page, and then you can then follow up with, well, like, hey, here's some more information, here's something else that might be valuable, um, that's really helped increase our engagement. Yep, okay, thank you. Um, so, Taryn, how much does automating, automation and scheduling pay a part in your consumer uh, interaction? Um, and do you believe it's intuitive enough to do the job for you without alienating the customer and making them feel like a number? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it plays a huge part in both of my businesses. Um, with Wink, with the app, all of the models, bookings um, are automated. They get SMS reminders, email reminders, calendar notifications. Um, and with the right fit, again, the sign-up process, the booking process. So much of that is automated. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it can be done in a way that doesn't make people feel alienated from your brand. Um, I guess in both of my businesses, I'm quite lucky in that the information we get on our customers, um, we do get things like their gender, their location, their interests, their hobbies, um, their skills, um, sizing, a whole bunch of information that means that we can um, provide, the information can be quite granular that mm. we can provide to them. Um, so I guess in that sense that we are really lucky. Um, but we did spend a lot of time with our creative director and uh, our copywriter in making sure, as you said, like the language that you're speaking to them, it has to be relevant. It has to be um, our tone of voice and it has to enc encompass all of our ethoses and values and making sure that we're engaging with them in a way that isn't going to alienate them, is going to make them feel supported and that the information we're giving to them is relevant and what they want to hear. Well, from a personal experience, because I'm signed up to your newsletter and um, you actually sent a newsletter and I didn't read it. And then you sent me an an EDM saying, you didn't read it. And I'm watching you, can you please read it? And I, I know actually you didn't read, read it. it. I thought, oh, I'm in trouble, oh my God. So I actually read, I clicked on it, and I, I think Should've I clicked on a couple time. of links just to make sure. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm done. Okay, moving on. <laughs> so I thought that was actually really clever because it actually made me read it. I thought, oh, God, I've been caught. Um, busted. So, <laughs> yeah, I was busted, I, I read it. I've read everyone since as well. Um, so, Danielle, what are your thoughts on the automation and scheduling? Yeah, sure. So, um, we take a fairly similar approach to everyone in terms of we measure everything um, and we definitely have systems in place to respond uh, when our customers uh, take particular actions in the software. Um, however, in saying that, uh, one of the philosophies that we have now, especially being such a new startup, um, is to do the unscalable. And I stole that, someone really smart in the startup space said it, and I wish I could remember who it was. Uh, but it's, so right now, um, we do take a bit of a manual approach to particular things on the site. So if you um, register interest on scrunch.com right now, I actually personally email every person that does that so that I can form a connection with them, I can really understand why they came to the website, what's driving them, and um, create a relationship. Um, so that's something that won't scale, and it's something that we will need to switch off over time. Um, but right now, while we're you know, right in the thick of growing, um, it's super important for us. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, so Julie, within the Style Runner organizational structure, how important has it been for you to combine your Chief Technology Officer with your Chief Marketing Officer? Um, so that both are across online user engagement, or are the two still separate for you? Um, no, we think marketing and technology are, you know, incredibly, um, you know, integrated. Mm. So even when we're hiring anyone in our marketing department, um, a lot of the time I'm questioning them about, you know, who they follow on Twitter and, you know, what they read in technology space. I think it's so important to be across, you know, the, the new technologies that are up and coming. There is a space, obviously, for marketing that is, you know, above the line or marketing that is um, in other channels. But a lot of the time, the marketing that is most effective and scalable is linked directly with technology. Whether that is with social media and you're looking at your analytics um, or your automating processes. Um, but a lot of the time, it's about your, your website. You know, conversion rate optimization is so crucial. Um, being able to tweak your site so that consumers interact with it in a way that increases the likelihood they'll convert um, is, you know, one of the most important functions for us. 
um, if we can increase conversion rates by 10%, you know, every d advertising dollar we spend or every marketing effort we make outside of our, our website is going to be 10% more efficient. Um, and we, we aim for more than 10% increases. Uh, you really can, you know, sort of double your um, efficiency for every advertising dollar. So marketing, um, you know, also goes into your CRM. We've just recently uh, finished customizing an enterprise resource planning system, which was pretty big for us. It's enterprise class. Uh, we, uh, we started looking into that when we were about a year and a half. And about two years old, we committed to an enterprise class platform. And it took us about one year to, to build and configure. Um, this system is going to be able to track everything from uh, what they've purchased on a price bracket, color, brand, so that we can recommend things that are similar. Um, we can dynamically merchandise things. So someone that previously bought something by Stella McCartney or Adidas by Stella McCartney, we'll show them other similar product, which is sophisticated, higher price point, etc. We'll be able to segment our newsletters on a similar basis. Um, so that's a perfect example of marketing and technology being so you know, crucially linked. I suppose it's almost come to a point where you probably wouldn't hire a marketing person these days without that digital element to their experience because... Yeah, I mean, that's where I guess whether you love or hate the term, growth hacking comes from. You know, it is a marketing um, mindset which is enabled by technology. And, you know, when we're looking at marketers to join our team, I want them to be obsessed with how technology can help them market more efficiently. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to move on to um, the rise of the influencer now and how it's, um, the influencers are essentially infiltrating the tech industry um, because it is a rapidly growing industry. I mean, we've got a couple of um, well, three people on the panel who are actually, you know, have built a platform to actually support that. Um, and Danielle mentioned this to me recently, that Adweek recently reported that 59% of marketers plan to incre increase their spend on influencer marketing in the next 12 months as a key part of their strategy. Um, so being such a new industry, I think one of the challenges is <laughs> is, um, is tracking it and making sure that the return on investment is there for, for the brands. Um, so Taryn, can we um, get your thoughts on what it actually means to be an influencer essentially and um, how do you decide if someone is, is an influencer and is it just based on the size of someone's social media following? Yeah, it's a great question and it's one that we get a lot from brands who are definitely looking to make a foray into this space and engage with an influencer. Um, and the short answer is no, it's so much more than just the number of followers they have. When you're looking for an influencer, it needs to be someone who has a real genuine, authentic reach in that field um, and they need to be the right fit for your brand. They need to be, um, as I said, they need to be trusted, they need to be aspirational, um, but in the right field for you. So. It may not be someone with a high number of followers. Obviously, a higher number of followers is great. It means your message is going to be amplified, but it is so much more than that. Um, for example, we work with ASICs on all of their global campaigns, and they will definitely check someone's social following, um, but not so to look for a high number of followers, but more so to make sure that that person is authentically healthy. They're a fitness um, advocate. They're grinding it out in the gym seven days a week, or they're a runner. You know, So they want to make sure that that person is a really authentic and trusted ambassador for their brand, irrespective of the number of followers they have. That's probably a good segue into the next question is essentially around how to measure their, their engagement and their actual influence, because it's, it's quite intangible, I guess, and it's about having a tool to, to measure it accurately. And Dan I mean, Danielle, since you've actually built a platform around this, um, can you tell us about the tech that you can use to measure it and how you go about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we... Uh, so we sort of um, use our own tool internally, but I think to, to backtrack on, you know, what is an influencer, what is uh, important to measure, uh, and measuring ROI on a campaign, um, I think Taryn's 100% right. It's so much more than just their followers. Um, you know, there's so many things that go into consideration. When we work with a brand, their brief extends so much further than the reach. Um, you know, it can be the location, it can be the aesthetic, it can be their tone of voice, um, the engagement they have with their fans. And, you know, oftentimes you'll find that that blogger with a million plus followers doesn't have the same connection to their uh, fans as someone with, say, 100,000 or even 50,000 followers does. So, super important to look at all of those different pieces of information. 
Um, as far as measuring a campaign, um, ROI is massive. It's, you know, every other marketing channel people talk about ROI and influencer marketing should be no different. Um, the one thing I would say is understand what metric matters in your business and that will be different for everybody. Uh, for a lot of people it is sales. Um, but other, other metrics are important on campaigns as well. It might be about brand awareness, it might be increasing website traffic or subscribers to a form. Um, so yeah, at Scrunch, that's one of the key things that we built into the tool was ROI tracking. So if you pay a blogger to produce a piece of content about your brand, that you can actually measure that down to your website traffic, engagement, e-commerce sales, um, so that you can understand the ROI and, and make better future marketing decisions. So using this tool, can you tell if someone's been a little sneaky and bought followers? <laughs> um, so yeah, right now there are key indicators. Um, so as far as uh, if you have, say, a blogger in a particular region and their uh, fans are located in a very bizarre region <laughs> or there's very little um, engagement and interaction, there's sort of all key tells that we sort of bring to the forefront in the dashboard so that you can figure that out. Okay, excellent. Um, so, Beck, can you tell me how a business goes about connecting to an influencer that's appropriate to their brand? And how reliable are ranking services such as Clout or Peer Index in validating the reach and engagement of digital authorities? Right. So, just little questions. Um, I think, um, so in terms of connecting with an influencer, I mean, it really does depend, just as Danielle said, what, what's your objective? Um, I, with, with Influencer Hub, potentially a lot of... Um, Clients are sort of looking at it from a, an employee advocacy platform. So, you know, you're looking internally to an organisation to start amplifying and creating content that they're sharing to their network because the intimate connection they have with their followers is probably quite meaningful and they're talking with authority from an organisation that they work for. So that can be a very, um, very real and very influential type, you know, person to have in that community. So, uh, but you know, if you're looking for different things, you might be looking for reach, you might be looking for brand awareness, you know, you might be looking for, to align with Kim Kardashian and, you know, have her showcase a, you know, a handbag that you've got, but she's not going to respond to you when you sort of respond to a, a or, or a, you know, respond to an Instagram post and saying, oh, how does it feel inside or what colour is it? So, you know, it really depends. That's kind of brand awareness and trying to elevate your brand values with Kim Kardashians, um, which is a little bit questionable. Uh, but, you know, you might sort of think, I, I would really like someone who's who's a little bit closer to me, who I can actually ask a question. They're going to respond, and there's, a, there's more meaningful, and they probably will get a better return on that investment. So it's it's horses for courses. Um, I very much with Influencer Hub, it's very much focused on sort of what I call the power middle, mm -hmm. sort of looking at at uh, people that um, have a smaller smaller number of followers potentially. Um, but have a very high engagement and there's a lot of trust. I mean, for me, it's all about trust and authenticity. So that's sort of they're the, the key sort of factors that are going to go into a brand's decision as to whether to invite them onto the platform or not. Um, as far as clout and peer index is concerned, I used to pay a little bit of attention to clout uh, when Hootsuite still offered it on its platform. It's, it's dumped it now. And I think that's probably a fairly sort of accurate insight into the future of those kinds of, um, I don't know, they, they seem to sort of be setting arbitrary kind of rules and people are trying to game it constantly. Um, uh, one of the things that I had to sort of found with, with clout in particular is uh, my clout score dropped all of a sudden because I was, I was engaging with people who didn't have high clout scores, who didn't have high reach. And I was thinking, well, that's sort of def that's just sort of you know denying the whole essence of what social media is. So I, yeah, I, I poo poo on those kinds of index. All right, is the technical term we're poo pooing. <laughs> um, so Julie, Style Runner, you touched on this before. You utilise um, social media very, very well, and you've essentially built up a cult following in a very, very short space of time. How have you used influence of influencers effectively to achieve this, and what was your strategy? Um, we have, you know, really relied on our social media, particularly Instagram. Instagram is the most effective channel for us. Um, we've used it to great effect. 
Uh, we did try a lot of different channels and um, we realised that we weren't getting as great a return on other things like Facebook and, and Twitter. So we've put almost, you know, the majority of our effort into Instagram. It's unfortunately resources are, you know, slim in a startup and you need to decide which channel works best for you. Um, what we've realised though is um, everyday people work really, really well. We are influenced by people who are similar to us. So, uh, and people actually like to see something that reflects themselves. So we could use celebrities. In actual fact, we have less engagement when we show product on our models on our social than we do when we're regramming, you know, mums wearing our product or, you know, other um, girls who might be similar to the rest of our community. We've actually had um, some people email us and tell us how much they love our social media channel because they've met other people like them through it and they've now become friends and they go out and they have coffee and lunch and they attribute that to our social media channel. Um, so I think that's really important and something not to lose sight of. It's, it's not necessarily who you would expect. It's not always the celebrities. It's not always um, models. It is, you know, real people who are just like your consumer. So you really need to understand who you are selling to and find people just like that, maybe with slightly more, you know, sort of aspirational uh, context in their life. Maybe they do have, you know, fabulous... Those people, they like, people like them, but they also want a little bit of aspiration to aspire to. Um, and yeah, we've, we've used that probably about 70% of mm -hmm. our content is regramming our consumers and letting them interact with each other. So f effectively, you've built an online community that's doing your selling for you. Yeah, and these people also become advocates. The mm -hmm. more they love your community, the more they are posting your product and you know, regramming, I'm loving my new style runner purchase. So that's another thing. It's about connecting with these people and turning customers into advocates. So it's not just our social media channel, which is reaching you know, larger and larger audiences. It's turning 400,000 people into you know, potential advocates who are talking to all of their, um, their audiences. Uh, we were able to track the following of our, our followers, and uh, it came to over 180 million people. Big. <laughs> um, thanks, Julie. Uh, Kate, you're considered a prominent influencer within the blogging community. Um, so how has your own influence enabled you to connect and gain more customers? Um, I think the main thing is, particularly if you're looking to, uh, I'm talking more from a DDG side of things mm. here, um, is being authentic to start off with and sharing brands and talking about brands that you generally are interested in, and then that generally is what would lead to the boat, to, sorry, the best relationships with brands. It's when, so, you know, for example, if we've done a roundup of our five favorite lipsticks or something, and, you know, each of the girls says, I like this one because, blah, 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 um, you know, you, we might get then a, one of those brands reaching out to us and saying, do you want to do a bit more? And then it's so much more genuine because we've said already, we literally really love this lipstick uh, versus having, you know, We've said these are our five favourite lipsticks, and then another brand comes up and says, <coughs> "Can you, um, can you say you like ours as well?" <laughs> um, I think it is just so much about just being, yeah, being authentic um, as Relatable. much as you can, yeah. Which is the, the, such a tricky thing, particularly for bloggers, because most um, or and influencers, because most of them, you know, if they're they want this to eventually be their full time gig, and if you know, especially at the start when you're building an audience, it's little bits and pieces here, and you know, someone says, "Here, have ten thousand dollars to say you like this lipstick." it can be very difficult for people to say no, but you've kind of got to have your, draw your line in the sand and say, no, if you build something that's a bit more authentic to start off with, it's going to pay off much better in the long run. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, we're gonna to move to our final theme now, which is talking about marketing via smartphone technology, um, because essentially more traffic is now coming from smartphones than the desktop computer. So Taryn, given you're launching an app for the right fit, um, where do you see the biggest challenges for business in terms of engaging with customers via smartphone technology? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I mean, we're seeing more and more um, of our customers using their smartphone as the primary way that they're going online, or in some cases, the only way that they're going online and interacting with us as a brand. So uh, it definitely presents some challenges. Um, obviously, the most obvious one is that there is only so much real estate in that screen that you can work with. So it's about getting really clear about what functionality uh, you need to have and how to best uh, display that in a smartphone or a smartwatch. Um, because you do only have such a small screen space to work with. Um, so that's really getting to know your customer, really doing that uh, user experience research, finding out how they're using it, what they want, and making sure that the experience is as seamless on a smartphone mm -hmm. as it is 
on a desktop and laptop. Um, we do also see a lot of people starting their journey with us on a smartphone and finishing it on a desktop or vice versa. So it needs to be a seamless process throughout. I think the other big one is obviously there's so many different devices now. So making sure that anything that you're building and that you're rolling out is being tested across all of those and that it works as beautifully on every single device. And I think one of the other biggest issues, I think, is that um, people are easily distracted these days. I mean, it's very hard to actually um, harness a customer's attention. And I think you've got, what, three seconds. And if something doesn't load quickly, they're off. They're onto something else. So Kate, in terms of um, capturing uh, attention, your consumer's attention, and then transitioning it into a sale or, at the very least, harnessing their data, how are you going about doing that? I think the most important thing is just being really, really clear on what the purpose of every single page on your platform is like, yeah, what, what is it there for? What is the number one action that you want people to take? And making sure that that is prominent, that that is going to be what loads first, that's going to be what grabs their attention. Um, and, you know, then you kind of let it trickle down from there. And if you've got your call to actions clear and up the top and you're not going, no, do this, no, do this, no, do that, like people don't have that, as you said, three second attention. You, you need to be really, really focused and really specific and just make it as easy for people as possible. Don't say, oh, do you want to do this thing? Then fill out this form with 15 different fields in it. Just get their email address. That's it. Like then you've, you know, you can ask them more questions later and add more information as you build your relationship. Or, but just, yeah, make it as simple and focused as possible. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, Julie, how, because you're, you're queen of numbers, you track everything. So how much do your clients um, use your site or the, buy their products via their smartphones versus the, lap or the desktop computer? About 45% of our traffic comes from mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a, a great part of that is because we drive a lot of traffic via our or Instagram channel again. So obviously, almost everyone on Instagram is viewing it via their phone, can view it on a desktop, but I'm sure hardly any of us know that because we never go there. Um, so a lot of our traffic comes directly from our Instagram channel. Um, there is a lower conversion rate for us, and we're always working on how we can improve our mobile experience. We're building a mobile app. Um, and you know our experience with testing has been larger photos work better. Obviously, it's a small screen. The bigger you can make things, the bigger your buttons, etc. Keep testing, A/B test, different colors, different sizes um, to increase your conversion rate, and you know continually think about the user experience. Yeah. So Beck, when you decided to build the influencer hub, um, what was the um was st smartphone technology a critical factor for you in, did you determine this is the absolute the way of the future and this is really where we need to head? Is that why one of the decisions behind it? Look, I, I think, um, Chiquita, one of the, the big factors was um, gig fulfillment for us. So, so the platform itself sort of creates, the, the brand creates content and then it's amplified and shared via, via the platform sort of through notifications by the influencers who are part of that community. And I, I just recognised that a gig, which is a content creation piece, was going to be fulfilled via a smart device. So it had to be, the user experience was pivotal in the design of how someone with one thumb could fulfil a gig mm. and get rewarded for it on the platform. And so that was the primary uh, driver. Behind. And, and also, it needed to be an app because we wanted to also share to Instagram. Yep. So there was some you know, obviously some functional requirements, but um, I just knew that people, I mean, people live and work and operate on the run all the time now. So um, everything has to accommodate the fact that you're going to be doing things in that three minutes when you're waiting for a tram or whatever. So it has to be very, very flexible and easy uh, to, to slot into your lifestyle. So, Kate, I might get your thoughts on this one. How far do you think um, the relationship between cons customers and their smartphones can actually go? So, where do you see it going in, say, the next five years? Um, that's a good curly question. Uh, I think at the moment, particularly with all the data and things like that that you can access about customers, it's still people are still having to ask the question before they get the answer. Mm. I think give it another few years, it will be just due to their behaviour or due to their, you know, their pulse or due to the temperature that, that, you know, the solutions will be being offered and provided before they actually come to the point of having to ask. So it could be something like um, your, every time you go shopping at the supermarket, you'll f it stores the data of what you've been buying. So it starts to realise that you need new milk every, you know, X days and then your 
it goes, okay, well, you should probably be running out of milk by now and you're about to walk past the milk bar, ding, you don't forget to go buy the milk. Or, you know, you walk into a supermarket and the, your fridge tells your smartphone that you've got this and this ingredient. So they start serving you ads for recipes that you could cook with a couple of extra ingredients and here they are and, you know, we know you've got this at home. Like it's just so the intuitive tools will be built and yeah. will be prompted before we actually know. Yeah, exactly. I think but the, the main risk with that is obviously there's going to be some issues around privacy mm. um, and also issues around people going to feel like they're being stalked. Like people are getting smarter and smarter, even with the retargeting stuff, a lot of, you know, the effectiveness of that I think is starting to drop a bit at the moment. So it's going to be not just about how can you sell to people at the right time, but how can you add value to them at the right time, which would then be something which then leads to a sale. Interesting. Any other thoughts? No, maybe Ditto. not. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, that wraps up um, the questions that I have. So now I'd like to throw to the audience in terms of, does anyone have any questions for the ladies on any of the themes or anything else that's been prompted throughout? We don't buy. No? <laughs> All right, then. Well, if there are, oh, we have a question. Thank you all, ladies. It's um, quite enlightening coming from probably the next generation. I was just um, messaging one of my colleagues saying, hey, it's so different. Um, you know, I'm in my mid-40s. My kids are still young, surrounded by you know, the difference in, in technology. Um, if, we, if we look at the different mindsets uh, across the generations, um, how do you, I, I guess, cater for a different um, I guess, experiences across your generational markets, or do you just target specifically those um, that, um, I guess, are with it from a, a social presence perspective? I think um, it seems to be that all the different social media channels are, seem to attract different people at the moment. Like, there's, like, you know, at the moment, Facebook is still quite effective for, uh, you know, mid-30s plus, um, whereas the, you know, Snapchat is where the teenagers are. So it's about figuring out, like, knowing, obviously, who your market is and going to where they are rather than trying to drag them kicking and screaming over to where you want them to be because, you know, that one is the sexy, cool new thing. And I think also everything sort of seems to have a bit of a shelf life unless they continue to evolve. So... Twitter is kind of in a really a, a really serious state of flux and I'm, I'm interested to see early adopters moving from Twitter to Snapchat because, because there is real engagement. I think that's what, you know, so we've got tools like Buffer and everything's being scheduled and so you're not really there but you're saying stuff and people know that now. So, but things, tools like Snapchat now, they kind of eliminate a little bit of that and it's harder to do. So that, that actually, I'm actually here and I will engage with you, which is the whole purpose of social media is kind of, I think is starting to show through some of, and some of the holes in some of the social media platforms. Um, similar to uh, Kate, I think it's definitely understanding who your audience is and finding the right match for that channel. Um, one of the other things that we keep in mind also is um, going after the low-hanging fruit. So for us, um, it's not so much about changing behaviour. I'm sure there's lots of audience out there that we could try and switch to, you know, with, with different types of behaviour. But what we know is that there are already a lot of consumers who are behaving in a particular way and that we go after the consumers who are easy to, to get via existing channels. I'm sure that as that starts to, you know, exhaust and competition increases, we do need to start being more innovative and thinking about how do we, you know, engage a, another, um, you know, demographic that we, we're not quite getting through to. But right now, there seems to be a lot of, of room for going after consumers who are really already interacting with us via existing channels. And um, going after those first seems to be a, a really easy win at the moment. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, we have another one. Hello. Hello. Uh, Julie, you mentioned about 45% of the traffic to your site arrives via mobile. How does that convert to purchases on the mobile versus the desktop or tablet platform? I'd love to hear responses from other people, too. Uh, so our conversion rate on mobile is about 
just over half of our desktop. So our desktop and tablets convert nearly twice um, as well as, as mobile. So we see a definite opportunity there around increasing conversion rate on our mobile. Um, I am told over and over again that that's a, a pretty regular trend, that mobiles just aren't converting as well. Um, but we always look at benchmarks and always ask ourselves, what could we be doing to increase that conversion? So as I said, um, one of the things we're doing is always A-B testing and seeing what we could do with our existing mobile site. Um, but data that I'm hearing all the time and, and even just amongst you know, small groups of friends is that um, you know, girls these days or women these days are downloading their favorite stores apps and they no longer go to a, you know, a browser on their mobile. They have four or five of their favorite stores apps and they spend two or three hours browsing those on the weekend and their shopping is done. So we definitely need to, um, you know, it's a race for us to get our mobile app out to the market. Um, and I think, you know, the, the data there seems to be that the average cart goes up, the return rates increase and the loyalty increases. No others? Okay, excellent. Well, we might wrap up there, ladies. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today and sharing your insights. And thanks to George for giving us this opportunity for the ladies to share their expertise. And thank you for listening. So, thank you.